to see so many people gather to train our minds together. So we'll start with a short guided meditation. And just beginning the meditation, bringing to mind the purpose of meditation. Initially, our intention is to bring the mind to peace. So if there's anything said in the guided meditation that doesn't feel conducive to bringing the mind to peace, then you're invited to just put that down. And one thing we can start with, beginning the meditation, just bring to mind any action you've done today of giving giving your time, energy, a material item, and see if you can tune into a feeling of joy, lightness, happiness related to that act of giving. And we all just took the precepts together. And so you can bring to mind your practice of virtue and just rejoice in that. It's a gift that you give to all beings, the gift of safety, of non-harming. And see if you can tune into a feeling of joy, lightness, ease. And so this is a way to brighten the mind, help the mind settle down. And just tell the mind, uh, just for right now, we'll put down any concern, any thoughts about the past or future, whatever activities or issues the mind might want to pick up. If the mind starts to pick it up, you just say, not right now. We can deal with that later, but right now is the time for bringing the mind to peace. So, having brightened the mind, recollecting, giving, or virtue, and just feeling the body, the weight of the body touching the chair or the floor, Noticing if there's any areas of tension or tightness. And inviting those areas to relax. Feeling the breath coming in. The breath going out. And if the mind isn't feeling settled quite yet, you can breathe in deeply, filling the whole lungs. And breathe out completely. You can do that three times. Breathing in. And breathing out. Breathing in, and breathing out. And then just tuning the mind into the channel of loving kindness. Offering the gift of loving kindness to oneself, to one's body and mind. And if you like, you can visualize a white light or golden light, whatever color you wish. Just the light of loving kindness soaking in to every cell of the body. You can imagine 
the light of loving kindness surrounding the body. You can set the wi make the wish in the heart. May I be well, may I be happy. May I be well, may I be happy. And just see if you can tune into a felt sense of loving kindness permeating the whole body. From the head to the arms torso, the waist, the upper legs, lower legs and feet. If there's any perception of discomfort or unease in the body or mind, can make the wish, may I be free of this suffering, may I be free of stress. And just notice how that wish to be free of stress is a very natural movement of the mind. Visualize or just focus on the words. A white or golden light of love and kindness surrounding and permeating the body. Or just the words alone. May I be well. May I be happy. Be well, may I be happy. May all beings in front of me be well and happy. And to whatever extent you feel capable, you can extend that feeling of loving kindness or imagine the light of loving kindness extending in front of you. And if the mind doesn't feel ready to extend loving kindness outwards, then you can just stay with sending loving kindness to oneself first. And that's also totally fine. So may all beings to the right, may they be well and happy. May all beings to the left, may they be well and happy. May all beings behind, may they be well and happy. May all beings above, may they all be well and happy. May all beings below be well and happy.
So to the extent that you feel able, you can permeate the body, the mind, and the space around oneself with the light of loving kindness, with the wish that may all beings, including oneself, be well and happy. And you can extend this to the people sitting around you, all the people in the room, all beings in this block of the city, all beings in Seattle, may they all be well and happy. And may all beings on the planet be well and happy. If your mind feels ready to extend it that far, May all beings in the solar system as much as you feel able <coughs> can wish may all beings in the cosmos without limit, without bounds may they all be well and happy developing the mind of loving kindness that's immeasurable, abundant, exalted, and purely wishing well. And starts to wander, just bringing it back to the wish visualization. May I be well, may all beings be well in all directions. And just keep repeating whatever phrase you find is most conducive to we're tuning into the loving kindness.
to <coughs> starting to close out the meditation, feeling the weight of the body against the ground, chair. Just making one last repetition of the phrases. May all beings be well and happy. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings, may their good fortune continue and increase more and more. May all beings have their own path, their own journey. May all beings rejoice and share in the goodness of our practice and our cultivation of the mind. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Buddham Dhammang Sangam Namasami. So with the permission of Venerables Ajahn Kalilo, Ajahn Disipo, just take some time to share some Dhamma reflections, try to share some encouragement for you in your practice and training of the mind. Having just done some loving kindness meditation, the mind doesn't always become peaceful, but if it does, the loving kindness meditation can lead the mind to feel very bright, radiant, spacious, happy. And one thing that distinguishes the teachings of Buddhism from other traditions is that you don't stop there because it's a very peaceful, even blissful, abiding. It's what they call loving-kindness, one of the 
uh, divine abidings or abode of the gods. We can feel very, it's a very pleasurable mind state. We can feel very at ease, very relaxed, very happy. And if your mind didn't feel peaceful on this occasion, never mind. But just speaking in uh, general terms, or hopefully at least some of the time. Um, but yeah, so one difference with Buddhism is that that's not the, the end point. It's very peaceful, very happy, and it's a beautiful state of mind. It's a beautiful mind. It's something that recharges the batteries of the mind, gives the mind strength and energy in order to live in a world that's filled with many types of sense impingement, many kinds of coarse moods and impressions and different problems and issues that we encounter from time to time or regularly. And so we need to give the mind strength and power in order to live happily in the world. Otherwise the mind gets bogged down with day-to-day -day problems and the moods of one's own mind and others' minds that one encounters. So I think we all know this very well, that the mind that lacks strength, that lacks mindfulness and wisdom, can feel darkened or muddled or bogged down by the experiences we encounter in life. And so whatever meditation object we use, whether it's the breath or recollecting various recollections, Buddha Dhamma Sangha, recollection of giving, virtue, devas, recollection of stillness and so on, or the Brahma Viharas like we did today, love and kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity, contemplating the body and so on. Whatever your object is, whatever your meditation object, you bring the mind to peace. And that's able to give strength and energy to recharge the mind. And this is very important to do. But we don't stop there. So with the mind brightened and strengthened, then we turn that mind to whatever degree it's been brightened and strengthened, whether a little or a lot. We all know sometimes we meditate and there's just a teeny bit of peace or it feels like there's no peace. But even if we feel like there's been no peace in the meditation, I think for myself and Hopefully you've noticed that if you just endure with an agitated mind and make effort for the meditation period, you'll come away feeling some strength of mind, some energy of mind that is more than before, even if the meditation itself didn't feel peaceful. So I find even if it feels like in the moment the mind is just scattered, not applying itself to the object of meditation, there's still benefit. The mind still gains benefit, more mindfulness, more energy, more resilience. And so we, whether the mind's a little strengthened or a lot strengthened, if it was a very peaceful meditation, and we turn the mind to look at our experience, look at the nature of our bodies and minds. Ajahn Anand will sometimes call this, uh, in terms of loving kindness practice, metta panya vimuti, which is Pali for loving kindness, wisdom, and liberation. So in hearing that teaching from him, at least for me, you see how they're all connected. One leads to another. And 
And so, for instance, like we were talking about this morning with some of the, uh, I was talking with some of you here about contemplating the body, which is a very uh, commonly taught practice. And it's in the suttas and very commonly taught in Thailand, where I uh, train and live, where our tradition's from. And I, I like to take a kind of step back and take a fresh look at we sort of walk around feeling like these bodies are me, are ours, belong to us, they are us. And that's just kind of, we kind of feel like everyone around us is doing it. We do it since we can remember, it's just normal. But having been trained as a, a scientist for most, most of my schooling career, I like to bring that attitude like an investigating scientist. And you just take a look. Well, well what's, what is the body? Is it, really, is it really me? Is it really myself? But I think this, this attitude of open-minded investigation, trying to really truly find the truth of the matter is quite important. Because we probably all know that in the Buddhist teachings, the body is, is not self, is taught to be not belonging to us. But then for most of us, we have that part of the mind that deep down it really thinks, well, no, it actually is mine. So we can have these two conflicting uh, beliefs or ways of thought in the mind. But if we just take a look and use this mind that's strengthened and brightened by the, the calming type of meditation practice, we can just look and see well, what is there really is, is the body even in our control? For instance, is the, does the body ask permission to feel sleepy, or permission to feel hungry, or to need to use the bathroom? Or does, does it just do those things of its own accord, even if it's not convenient? I remember there was one occasion I was in a, a period of severe illness and I was trying to walk from one point to another and there was a lot of fatigue in the body and at one point the body, my body just sat down and it, in my mind it was very clear I was telling my body to get up and move but it just wouldn't do it. It was like talking to a, a stone or a or a log on the ground, it just wouldn't do anything I would tell it to. And so not that this was some kind of total enlightenment experience, but something we can, we can all reflect on and just say, well, if the body won't even do basic things you tell it to, then uh, how much can you really say it belongs to you? Like the trees in the forest, we might say, oh, that's my tree, my property. But when the seed sprouted, when it grew up, nourished by water and sunlight and soil, did you order those things to happen? Or did it just happen according to natural causes and conditions? And then eventually the tree will, will die, and rot, degrade, disintegrate. And again, it doesn't ask anyone's permission to do those things. It just does them according to, to the weather, uh, climate conditions, uh, and internal conditions of the tree itself, and so on. And so we don't, even if we 
think the tree is ours. We really see, well, it doesn't listen to us. It follows natural laws. Our bodies are the same way. They don't ask permission to get sick. Or when is a good time to, to die. They just do it when the causes are appropriate for those things to happen. And we can also ask, again, you know, with that open attitude of, well, why would we bother to even think about these things? And what's the benefit right now? We might, maybe we're not sick and we're not dying at the moment, we feel like. So what's the purpose of this kind of uh, thinking? And so, for myself, I find the more that I can see the body as it's a natural phenomenon. It's a it's a living organism that, in truth, belongs to nature, belongs to the world. It doesn't belong to to me. It doesn't have an owner. But I try to use it for a good purpose. And so in that sense, I'm very grateful to have a human body for the opportunity to cultivate merit and spiritual virtues like kindness and patience, determination, effort, wisdom. And so you can have a, a very loving, grateful attitude towards the body as our temporary vehicle in this world. Because we all know that it's, we only use it temporarily, whether we're in denial about it or not, we do know it won't last forever. So we can have an appreciation, love and kindness, and gratitude. But we see that just like anything we use in the world, if we can use it with the right attitude, something that is very light-hearted and it's a very happy way to live. Well, if we're very fixated on forcing conditions or trying to make conditions the way we want them to be, then we just create uh, endless suffering for ourselves, a suffering with no end. We want the body to stay young, we want it to stay healthy, I want it to stay alive. I want it to do this or that. Even simple things like we want our our brains and our bodies to work well, but if even if we're just quite tired or hungry, then we know that different systems and even the operation of the brain and thoughts won't work quite well. So even on a day-to-day -day basis, it's already kind of a going against what we want. But if we can see it with the right attitude, with the right view, it's not belonging to us, something we use to cultivate skillful qualities, then our body can be a great teacher for us teaching us about where we're attached, where we could make the effort to let go. It can teach us about patience, teach us about all the things of the world share the same nature. Their nature is to change, the nature is they're not satisfying, don't bring us lasting happiness. And we're, there's no owner to be found. And just like the, the Buddha once said, the beginning and ending of the world can be found right here in this body. So it's something to consider, to look into 
how do we relate to the body and what is it that we're, what is it actually that we're relating to what is the body actually where did it come from where is it going even in this very moment do we even do we see what what is it in this very moment composed of various liquids and solids and moving and functioning in different ways, obeying some commands to a certain extent, but others not so much. We have temporary ability to move our limbs and mouths and vocal cords and so on, but particularly asking it not to age, not to sicken, not to die. The body doesn't listen to that. But it's very important that, at least for my own practice, my own mind, with the tendency to personally have a tendency to kind of a melancholy, I can fall into a depressed state if I'm not uh, careful. So looking at these contemplations, balancing it with loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity, to keep the mind in a balanced state, because kind of the heavenly states of loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity, we can also get lost in those as well, kind of like a high level uh, angel or deva, and it's a very nice place to be, but if we really look at it, we see that those heavenly states, they also don't last. So it's not our true home. It's not our true resting place. It's just a temporary, temporary resting place. And so there's many ways to phrase the goal of Buddhist practice, but I could say one way to put it is that we're looking for our true home looking for the true place of rest where we're truly safe and secure. And that's a lasting happiness that won't disappoint, that doesn't change on us. And so that's a goal that I personally find very inspiring and worthwhile. And we're taught that no matter how difficult the practice is, no matter how many trials and tribulations we have to go through, no matter how painful and uh, grueling the training of the mind might seem. But we're taught, and I believe that it's all worth it, that even if the practice were a thousand times more difficult than it actually is for us, even that would still be worth the realization of the happiness of the Buddha and something that we're all capable of achieving if we apply ourselves to it. So I wish you all the best with your practice. I wish you all success. And I feel a lot of sympathetic joy and rejoicing that all of you have the faith and wisdom and effort to, to come here, set aside time, renounce all the various worldly pursuits and pleasures you could otherwise be pursuing to come train your mind for your own benefit and for the benefit of all beings. So I sincerely rejoice and feel very happy for all of us here and may you uh, succeed in your practice and realize uh, lasting happiness.
you very much, Venerable. So now we have a period of Q&A, um, and maybe we can retrospectively introduce uh, Venerable Tejadamo, actually. Um, so Ajahn Tejadamo was born in Berkeley, but grew up in Boston, and then ordained. You've been living in monastery now for seven years, eight? Uh, six. Six years. No? Is that right? Is that speaker working now? Yeah? Okay. Well, could the people online here? Yes, great. So it's recorded and people can listen to it later, maybe. Um, so, yeah, this is Venerable Tejadamo, um, and we're very happy to hear, have him here in Seattle. He'll be here until Thursday. And yeah, he ordained at Wat Map John, which is where Ajahn Nisibo ordained, and is just visiting the States for about a month. So uh, he helped translate for our group of pilgrims when we were in Thailand at Wat Map John last month. And it's just a really lovely mon monk. So hopefully everyone will have a chance to, anyone who wants to come and meet and talk with him. Uh, you can come out and offer alms at uh, Pike Place later this week. So yeah, we can open things up to questions now and I think we'll just take turns. Um, so maybe we can pass this mic around. Um, I did actually hear some of the Dhamma talk and um, um, in parts that um, it's just a reflection, it's not a question, um, but I, I think we were discussing earlier the four elements and sort of um, to hear sort of going back and forth can be to um, sort of uh, appreciating what the body allows us to do um, but balancing it with contemplation of the four elements um, that um, really resonates for me and works for me and also I loved hearing not getting that we can sort of sometimes get caught in the um, Brahma Viharas like because I really um, what happens is I think I go there and just like it's yay and then when I don't stay there it's really hard when I'm not there and to keep in mind that um, it's actually we're going beyond that that was very helpful to hear just that reminding of that's a temporary place and we are aiming um, beyond that so I thank you for that Satu. Is that uh, audible? Okay. <laughs> um, oh yeah, thank you for the comment. And just felt inspired to share further reflection. Um, so I think, you know, heavenly states of mind are accessible through really all the meditation objects, but particularly the Brahma Viharas, you know, loving kindness and so on. Uh, seem particularly conducive to heavenly states of mind, at least for myself and others I've spoken to. But I think it's helpful to remember that we're not alone in that experience of when the mind's in a heavenly state and then that state itself is 
by, def by its very nature can't last forever. And so we will come down from it at some point. And that coming down from that can be quite rough, can be quite difficult. In the Buddhist cosmology, it's compared to a deva. When a deva dies and is reborn as a human, it can be pretty rough. Um, <laughs> and at least that's something I relate to and I think we could all relate to. Sometimes the human world feels fairly rough, uh, can feel somewhat coarse. And so I think it's helpful to remember that it's not our fault. We didn't do something wrong. But these states, their very nature is to change. Their very nature is to not last. Because any state of becoming, any birth, is, uh, death is inherent within that. Ending is inherent within the beginning. And so to remember, yeah, it's, we didn't do anything wrong. It's not our fault. It's just the nature of phenomena. And it's and just to, yeah, like it'll, it'll, it can feel rough. It can feel harsh when we come down from those heavenly states. But just to remember, this is an opportunity to apply wisdom and to learn from that and and also just be gentle and kind to yourself and remember yeah it's okay that's part of the, the process and, but ultimately of course when the wisdom is cultivated through that then we can go beyond that that process of always coming and going from one state to another which uh, can give us some hopefully give us some strength of heart as well Hello, uh, my name is Sawyer. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to point out to anyone that hasn't noticed already, there is a cat on the Zoom right now sitting on someone's chest and they're adorable and very fluffy and they're bringing me joy. Um, and then second of all, this is um, in a similar vein, not necessarily a question, but more just a curiosity that I'm hoping any of you can speak to. Um, it was really awesome to hear you talking a lot about the body and how we relate to our bodies. Um, I'm doing a lot of work of relearning what it means to be comfortable and know my body and know myself, and it's a lot of work. Um, and um, I have an experience I don't know if anyone else relates to, but my one of my parents um, has been on the Buddhism path for most of my life, and so I've grown up kind of experiencing one of my parental figures going through this journey and learning all these things. And me and my dad both have um, a lot of trauma that blocks us from being able to understand our bodies. Um, and so we're learning a lot about that together. And so there's kind of two parts. One is um, how do you, how do you do your best to stay in that enlightened state, stay in that awesome mind state when your body is telling you something so different is going on, even though you know you're safe, your body feels really yucky. And then the other piece is um, kind of how that ties into healing in general. I'm sure that n not every um, monk or person who's coming to seek out this path has already done all their healing. Um, and so how do those paths kind of work together? Um, do you find that you're able to work on them um, cohesively and healing and this path together that they just kind of come up as they come up or that you had to maybe set aside or work on some other things and pick and choose when you may have to work on them. Gotcha. Yeah, so very, very good question. Thank you for bringing up that topic because I think Again, it's a, uh, you're not alone in that. I know for myself, I can resonate with a lot of what you said, and I think a lot of people could. Um, but I'll just speak from my personal experience, which may be most direct and relevant. But uh, for myself, yeah, having certain uh, kind of what you call unresolved traumas and uh, very painful uh, experiences that were felt within the body, even though there also, there's a, the mind aspect as well. But and that was something that I started meditating uh, and then these different traumas would come up and, uh, you know, going through like a kind of severe PTSD at one point and, and so on. And I really loved metta practice, but I couldn't actually feel metta in my body because it just felt painful and uh, uncomfortable. 
And one thing that was very helpful was to imagine loving kindness outside the body kind of coming in from, I would do different things. Like I, I would just imagine the universe itself was just made of loving kindness and I'm sort of swimming in a field of loving kindness. And another method that I could recommend that I've used is imagining a being that you perceive to be totally loving and accepting of you. You know, it could be a Buddha, could be a Bodhisattva, could be, you know, Jesus, could be your grandmother, parent, you know, whoever, it doesn't matter who it is. It could be even yourself and your like enlightened self, just whatever concept or perception you find conducive. Um, and, and that started to soften the edges of it and just kind of let it in more and more. But I found that m mindfulness, wisdom, loving kindness were able to be cultivated as habits, even though there were parts of the mind and parts of the body that felt just tight and dark and not accessible, basically. Um, but it, I would wish to you know, sort of give you encouragement or some strength of heart, like, which felt important to me as well, that I wasn't sort of failing or I wasn't incapable because I could still cultivate these wholesome habits. It was just that there were certain parts of the body-mind that just weren't really, you know, it was like sort of a closed door, like a dark space that I couldn't really get at uh, successfully. But like that was okay. And just to be okay, like, okay, there's this kind of dark knot or painful space that I don't have the capacity to fully be with because it's just too overwhelming, it's too much. But for the, just in that moment, so like that's okay. I don't have to have the capacity to fully feel all of that right now. I just feel as much as I'm able to and, you know, just kind of touch the edges of it and, you know, back away and rest and take a break from it as well and come back when you're ready. And then for myself, it took many years, I don't know, basically, yeah, most of my adult life, most of my practice. But then it did, yeah, gradually open up and soften and, you know, personally used a psychotherapist as well as Buddhist teachers and so on, you know, before becoming a monk. And, uh, and it was something that was capable to be healed. And um, not saying I'm, like, healed of everything, I'm not, like, not totally enlightened, but that, the part of me that I'm speaking to that was, like, that trauma um, did feel at one point did resolve um, a couple, maybe a couple of years into my monastic life. So I would just wish to, yeah, give some encouragement that it's something that's definitely possible to be healed. And I, for me, the cultivation of love and kindness, bodily mindfulness, the attitudes of acceptance, and also wisdom, the wisdom to see that these conditions of the mind are impersonal, like the traumatic events, you know, weren't my fault and they weren't anyone's fault, truly speaking. They were just things that happened that the nervous system couldn't integrate. And just to see it as, it's more of like a natural process as opposed to some kind of personal demon or burden or personal failing or, you know, because when you see it as a personal burden or failing or something, it just makes, just adds pain on top of pain. This is not necessary. So I would encourage basically all, or for myself, all these aspects of Buddhist practice, patient endurance, wisdom, mindfulness, loving kindness, were very critical to the healing process, as well as bringing in, you know, kind of psychotherapeutic and modern day concepts of healing as well. So it's probably go on for hours about it's one of my favorite topics, but it's probably it's probably enough. <laughs> Hi, Johns. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I have two distinct questions. My first one is, how, how do you recommend we skillfully um, incorporate visualizations of decay when uh, meditating on body contemplation? And then my second question is, when we're following this path, would, do you, are we burning off karma or are we burning off ignorance? 
Thank you. Good questions. Um, for me, the one skillful way to, you know, for those who don't know with body contemplation, the, the Buddha recommends three main techniques, and it's contemplating the 32 parts um, of the body, and there's a list in the suttas you can reference. Um, uh, contemplating the four elements and then contemplating the charnel ground contemplations, which is kind of watching the body in various states of decay. And um, for me, watching the decomposition um, can actually be, uh, a, can beautifully transition into four elements if you um, don't just end with the vision of the remains of the body, but really understand what's happening as the flesh and um, blood decay, um, you know, the, if you can imagine kind of a, a corpse um, in a forest uh, and, you know, kind of a lush, fern-filled um, grove and watch as the earth element in the body, the solidity kind of decays and understand that it's returning to the soil and how the liquid element, the blood, is returning to rain and the water and how the heat in the body, the fire element is returning to the heat all around the, the forest and returning just to the level of heat in the, the sort of living, breathing uh, grove and how the air element, the movement, is just disappearing into the movement of that whole forest around it. And rather than just ending with the body's decay, understand it as kind of returning to uh, a much larger picture of life. And for me, this is the way that um, watching the body decay becomes actually filled with a certain sweetness as you understand your connection to, to the world and like you are just borrowing the body and to really see that clearly. I mean, there's a huge sweetness there when you understand you're just rain, water, earth, um, you know, put together for a moment and um, I think if you see that clearly, it is it is meaningful. Um, but I'll let the other venerables speak to the other aspect and the second question as well. Uh, yeah. So the question about when we're practicing, are we burning off karma or burning off ignorance? Was that the, the question? Um, yeah, that's a, a metaphor which sometimes you'll find in different practice circles that the more that I sit, as long as I am able to just watch my body equanimously, then I'm burning off something. I'm burning off old karma or I'm not doing karma and then eventually, you know, I'll be at karma zero or something. <laughs> and and actually, I don't think the Buddha, like in the in the oldest suttas actually use that, that metaphor um, in terms of burning something off, like we've got a certain supply of oil or something, and then um, we're just, through our practice, just burning it off, and it's going to eventually be empty, and um, then we'll go out, and that's Nibbana. Um, rather, practice is more of, of seeing clearly, both seeing the working of Kama clearly, and seeing the working of, of ignorance and, and the opposite of that. So, um, yeah, as we, as we sit, it, I think it, it can be useful at times, especially if you're going through and experiencing a lot of, like, uncomfortable feelings, to um, conceive of things in a way that this is, this is practice. If I'm able to kind of be with this and, and watch it and, and not react, um, not kind of go with the habitual tendency to hate it, because that's what you, everybody wants to do with what's uncomfortable. You just want to get rid of it. But if I can actually just, just be with it, then that is practice. And, um, but at the same time, also over our whole practice, really uh, not acknowledging that it's not just a rote practice. You know, you can't, I can't just sit and then all will magically like, get better if I 
just keep sitting hard, you know. It's, it's a matter of just seeing clearly like how I am the one who's uh, creating my own suffering by, uh, by disliking it or by uh, craving for, for something different. And, and seeing that process um, is, is the Buddhist path. Um, so I think that's, that's more how I relate to the, the practice. I don't know if any of the other venerables wanted to speak to that. So just a couple of thoughts coming up while listening to the venerables. Um, just about the first part, something we were talking about with a few of us this morning about body contemplation, uh, something Ajahn Anand would say a few times that basically clinging to the body and thinking it's mine, it's like a rope, something tied around the heart. And so whether you see contemplating the body with the four elements or disintegrating or as a corpse and so on, whatever it is, if you see it clearly that, oh, it doesn't actually belong to me, it's like loosening those bonds around the heart. And the experience of loosening those bonds is something very joyful, radiant, bright, uplifting. And so his, basically Ajahn Anand's point was, if you contemplate the body, the mind should be joyful, bright, and radiant. And uh, at least for me, it's important to remember that because it, it can get kind of uh, maybe not joyful <laughs> or not, not bright, depending on, the, especially with the corpses and uh, body parts sometimes. And then in terms of that second part, I would I sometimes get these kind of thoughts, maybe based on things I've read. But one just framework I found helpful is seeing ignorance as an activity, just like Ajahn Kohilo was saying. But basically, it's ignorance. You're ignorantly clinging to things as me and mine. And that's an action. That's a present moment karma that you're constantly making. You're making the new karma of clinging to things. And that's what you want to stop doing. So if in, if in the present moment you can see, oh, right now I'm clinging to this experience, or just well, it doesn't matter what the object is, you see, oh, I'm clinging to this and that clinging is coming from ignorance. So you see that, yeah, so what kind of karma are you making in the present moment? Um, so I find that that was a helpful framework for me. Um. Um, just one more thing. Um, on the point of burning off karma and or ignorance, I, I do think it's helpful um, Sometimes when a really consistent point of suffering or uh, uh, unskillful habit comes up again and again and we just can't find the right way to contemplate or let go of it or seek conditionality, it's just there. Um, I, I think there is something to remembering, um, you know, the Buddha speaking about patient endurance as the supreme de incinerator of defilement. Like often there is a place with certain mind states to know that if you kind of keep your head down and don't react and just see suffering there and, and know it as dukkha and kind of bow to it, um, that's, that's enough. And, and some mind states and real deep woundings, that's all you can do. Like Tentejadama was saying, until the knot resolves after a few years. But you are, you know, we are referencing a sutta this morning where the Buddha speaks about how if one cultivates the 37 factors of awakening, then um, the mind moves towards liberation, whether or not one always has the thought, may I attain Nibbana, just as a sort of beached ship over a few seasons, it's rigging, dissolves. Um, so like to have faith that, yes, we don't want practice to become rote, but there's some points of suffering where it's good to know like, you don't have the bandwidth to figure it out and sometimes it really is enough to move through it without reacting to it and just to come back to that most simple, clear point of right view the Buddha gave us, which is suffering. And you can use that one on just about anything if you need to. Like, okay, that's dukkha. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, I think that can be very helpful. It's like some, some obstacles are so big, you don't get to go over them. You have to bow under them, you know, and, and go under them for that, so. Yeah, um, we probably do have to wrap up, but 
you all get Tentejidama for so few days. Um, is there one brief other question we have room for? A Zoom question, and we'll just make it quick. Hi, Ajahn. I hope you're all happy and well. Um, my question is about uh, one of the five recollections, uh, the, particularly the fourth recollection that we will be separated from everything we hold dear. I was thinking about that in terms of the uh, a story I had heard about Thich Nhat Hanh. He said that after his mother passed away, he suffered for a year until he realized that she was in the clouds, she was in the water and the earth and the soil. And that reminded me of the elements contemplation. Is that uh, the purpose of the six elements to erode this sense of separation that we contemplate in the four, in the uh, fourth uh, recollection? Uh, we try to dissolve the illusion of separation. For an another example, you guys went to Bodh Gaya and uh, uh, a sacred pilgrimage, but at Bodh Gaya, it's all earth, water, fire, wind, space, and consciousness. So everywhere we go is earth, water, fire, wind, space, and consciousness. So if we suffuse any area with metta, uh, then everywhere is both guided. Yes, yes well, sorry, I guess share whatever thoughts I might have, and then we'll see whatever else uh, the Ajans might want to share. So that's yeah, one of my favorite contemplations. I will be separated from all that I love and hold dear. I have not gone beyond that. And the reason it's one of my favorites, because, I mean, it just sounds kind of horrible, I guess, but <laughs> the reason I, I like it is because it just feels like it touches my heart very deeply, and it feels true. Like, there's a sense of, like, yeah, that is how it is, isn't it? Um, and there's something soothing about true words being spoken that brings solace to my heart and brings peace to my heart even though it's something that none of us want like it's painful but I think we all know like like yes that is how it is um, and that is th that reflection in a certain sense could be like that's one way I can understand like why I came to this path of practice at all is really from that uh, experience of separation from the loved but also in terms of uh, what you said in your question, the, four, the first of those four reflections, uh, particularly in mean, the fifth on karma, uh, has somewhat of a different flavor to me, but you know, not gone beyond aging, not gone beyond sickness, not gone beyond death, separating, must separate from all that I love and hold dear, very much on the conventional level, because uh, it's you know, these bodies that age, sicken and die, and it's, and in terms of separation, that's something that happens in terms of convention, where there's a me here, and there's a you there, there's separation. Um, so going back to the question about, yeah, if you see all well, these, these bodies, these selves that we take as ours, it's really just earth, air, fire, and water, uh, kind of temporarily stuck together, and then it just falls apart later, and there's nothing there, that's mine. Um, so that's that's also true, but I think the four for me those five reflections are helpful because there's that acknowledgement of like yeah I'm, I'm just not there yet like I don't actually understand yet that <laughs> there's no self to be found and that there's no me or you in terms of the actual reality of the mind is like there's very much a me and there's a you and that's the world that most of us tend to live in and I think that's the value in those reflections because it's speaking to our current experience of uh, conventional sort of uh, understanding of our, our lives and clinging to things as self but in terms of from what I understand particularly listening to Ajahn Anand you know, he'll, the way he'll describe his understanding or his uh, experience and or just, oh, he'll, he'll describe a way of looking at things. He'll just say things like, oh, you know, it's just these four elements of earth, air, fire, and water, and there's this knowing element, which he calls the mind, that clings to it as self. But he said, but actually, there, there's no one there to be found. There's, 
nothing to, to get upset about. And to bring it to a more practical example, there was one occasion that I'm fond of remembering a kind of high-ranking monk came to Wat Mop Chun, which is where he lives and where I live. And uh, this particular occasion, this monk was maybe saying critical things and just kind of showed up and being just critical and <laughs> saying negative things. It was kind of normally a very upsetting experience. And Ajahn Anand afterward, he, he was just sharing with myself and some others, just saying, you know, you look at it and you say, well, it's just, it's just like a puppet or a robot. It's like this body of earth, air, fire, and water doesn't have any clue what's going on. It's just this mind operated under the influence of ignorance, just kind of driving this little organic robot around telling it to do stuff. But he said, so who is there to be angry with? Are you going to be angry with the organic robot? No, that doesn't make any sense. Are you going to be angry with ignorance itself, which is influencing the mind to tell the body to do these things? He says, no, that, that also doesn't make any sense. So he said, oh, so there's nothing to be angry at. But the way he said it is it actually looked like he actually wasn't angry at all, which is what kind of touched me, of like, oh, wow, like this is actually possible for a human being to actually reach the point <laughs> where they understand that what he was saying well enough that it, they're actually not upset by these things. Um, so I just offer that as hopefully an inspiring or useful story. And again, like personally, like I'm not at that point. Like I still have delusion and think in terms of, of me and you. So I find those five reflections very helpful. But I also have faith that yeah, with effort and practice, our minds are capable of seeing oh yeah, these natural elements are just natural elements and the mind doesn't actually have to cling to them as some kind of personal possession and a mind in that doesn't cling, doesn't uh, suffer and doesn't, exp there's no longer separation uh, and there's, act according to the suttas, you know, there's no longer any des designation or concept one can apply to that uh, level of experience. All right, all of us moving robot puppets. That's great. Um, um, so, uh, so, yeah, how about if we uh, will go into uh, a few announcements, but just before then, maybe we can just all... Uh, spread meta and 